Well, good morning. I want to encourage you to find a seat. We're going to start in just about one minute. So I want to get you a chance to find your seat. you here. It makes a difference that you're available to uh, stand in support, encouragement, uh, comfort for the family. Uh, we're here to remember Ursula, it's going to take me a minute, Ursula, Elsa, Gertrude, Falk, Mueller. Uh, and uh, you're going to learn some interesting things about her life that you very likely uh, did not know before. You can learn about her trust in the Lord, her faith in God. Uh, I have a note when talking with the family about her life. She did know her Lord. She still wanted to go to church every week up until the point where she was really not able physically to do so. Uh, but then I wrote uh, that the family shared. She sang songs with gusto. So there you go. The gauntlet has been thrown. Let's see how we do. Let's uh, pray and then we'll worship the living God. Living God, we are grateful to you for your life, for your gifts, for the people that you send into our lives that make such a difference in our journey, uh, through our own uh, journey here on this planet. So we ask you to do what you always promise to do, which is to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death so that we don't have to fear any evil. We welcome your presence. We acknowledge your presence. And we ask you to pour out your grace and your goodness and your mercy and your compassion on each family member, on her sons, daughters-in-law, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, unless they're in the nursery, uh, but pour grace on them uh, as well. And all for uh, friends and loved ones, uh, th God, thank you for meeting us here. We acknowledge your greatness and your goodness, and we rejoice in the fact that she is right now singing songs with gusto in your presence, uh, right along with Harry and so, so many other people that we know and we love. So we ask you to... Uh, direct our thoughts today. We ask in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder and power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, 
How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, when through the I wonder and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And then sings my soul, my sin. God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come with a shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God. How How great thou art, how great thou art. Seated. Uh, we are here today to remember Ursula Elsa Gertrude Falk Mueller. Oma, more simply put, born July 14th, 1926, in Berlin, Germany, entered into arrest February 27th, 2024, at the age of 97, in San Dimas, California. She was preceded in uh, coming into the presence of the Lord by her husband, Harry. Uh, she is lovingly remembered by her children, Frank. I do have a note here in brackets. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to read this or not, but Frank was supposed to be Monica. And, <laughs> and he'd be quite happy if you'd call him that. It's a, it's a beautiful memory. And Thomas. 
Four grandchildren, Michael, Eric, Christy, and Jeffrey, and Daniel's son. Five, sorry, it, it, the way I wrote this out, Danny, you've got, it looks like you're almost in the great-grandchildren, but you are a great-grandchild, so, okay. And by her great-grandchildren, Grace and Nathan, Zachary, and Zane. She was born to parents Wilhelm and Gertrude Falk. Uh, she is, uh, was preceded in uh, death by one sister, Ingrid. Now, uh, her sons will tell you a little bit more information in a few moments. I'm just going to give a little bit of an outline. Uh, this couple met after World War II. They actually met at a New Year's Eve party. She was a bookkeeper, and they were married in, on November 19, 1950 in Berlin, and uh, lived in Berlin until they arrived here, and there's a story. Uh, arrived in the United States on, in 1951 on May 9th. They bought a home in Rosemead next to Harry's cousin. Uh, she had uh, a high school education and worked as a, an accountant, which makes some sense if you know her family, and CPA, uh, worked in the cafeteria, worked as, uh, was part of the PTA was part of the choir at church. Uh, she was a, uh, worked at the Punch Press and the Bavaria, uh, Bavarian Inn. She was an operator for our Uncle Fritz. Uh, hobby, she was known for her gardening, uh, for her green thumb. In fact, one of her uh, uh, outlaw in-laws, uh, Robbie Rotz, uh, in a message to the family, talked about remembering her Tomato, was it tomato casserole? Salad, tomato salad, cold. That would make sense more, right? She was very proud of her tomatoes. She made quilts for the mission field. Uh, she loved uh, dollhouses and villages to collect. She was uh, gifted at poker and cards. She was very thrifty. You'll see in the pictures this fact. She loved babies, and we have a, a debt as extended family that... Uh, it didn't need to be her own kids, grandkids, great-grandkids. Uh, any baby that was placed in her arms, uh, even in her much later years, you could see she just loved uh, babies. She was faithful and loyal coming to the boys' sports games. She was tough and hardworking. She was strong. She was loyal to her friends. Uh, how strong? Well, she suffered a a broken back while pregnant with Tommy, which brings up several other maybe comments I could make, but today I won't do that. She loved to cook and to bake. She loved gift giving. She was hospitable, and she did know her Lord, and he gave her strength through those 97 years. Uh, she still wanted to come to church every week, and uh, it was uh, very often I would be able to greet her, and uh, often Jeannie would wheel her in in later years when she was able to come, and she was happy to, happy to be here, and we were happy to see her. Uh, she sang songs with gusto, as I said, and uh, she liked her kids praying for her. Now we're going to get a little bit more firsthand uh, reports, first of all from son Frank Mueller. Or Monica. Thanks, Doug. Yes. You said everything I was going I, to. The whole thing. You have a. You'll have an inside perspective. I'm not sure how this is going to work. I'll pick it this way. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, Doug did steal a lot of what I was going to say. I had no idea he was going to doing that. I was just going to say that she. My mom was a, a very sweet young lady, young, um, and her parents, who I got to meet for six months out of my life, they lived with us. That would be Wilhelm and Gertrude, um, Oma and Opa to me, my, my grandparents. And they lived in our house, and I got to live in the hallway <laughs> for six months. It's Tommy, too. And, and so that was kind of our, our, our experience with them. My grandma was very, very sweet, a very lovely lady who would give us anything that she could. And I was in, 
I was one of those lovely middle schoolers when they were here. So I'm sure that they didn't enjoy us as much as they might have, but nah, that's the way it goes. But mom, mom was uh, a lot of fun in some ways and very strict in others. You know, she, she kept a tough handle on Tommy and I. Um, we didn't get away with a whole lot, but it was, you know, we deserved everything we got. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, way back in, in 1949, she went to a New Year's Eve party, and so did my dad. Dad went with his friend Hans first, and Hans introduced my dad to my mom. And they, after that, they got together, and uh, they just, they fell in love, and they stayed together until my dad passed in 2008, yeah. And so it didn't take long for their relationship to develop. In 1951, my dad decided he was going to come to the United States. And mom goes, what? So she says, okay, I'm going with you. And we are going as husband and wife and they did, and they, in, on May 9th, 1951, they hopped on a plane, took that plane to New York City, took them 16 hours to go from Germany to New York City. These were old prop planes. They didn't have jets back then. And then once they got to New York City, they flew another plane for another five and a half hours to Los Angeles. Well. When, when my mom and dad left Germany, they were only allowed $8 in their wallets. That was it. You take any more money than that, you've got a problem. So mom and dad were very good about that. They took their $8 each, and they were allowed one suitcase that weighed 20 pounds or less. 20 pounds, that's not much. In doing that, they said, well, what can we do to carry more stuff? So they took their, all their jackets and they kind of put one jacket on top of another jacket, <laughs> on top of another jacket. They really did the layering down pat. So they finally get to the point, because on the plane they're, they're wearing all these clothes all the way through because there was no place to put them. So when they got to LAX, they got off the plane and this is when they have to walk down steps in the tarmac to get down and they open the doors to the plane and they realize it's 105 degrees outside. <laughs> they did not appreciate the, the hot weather immediately. Anyways, um, when they left Germany, neither one of them spoke a word of English outside of probably yes or no, you know, a few basics, but they didn't know how to speak anything. So when they got here, they were sponsored by my, my great uncle, it was my father's uncle, Fritz Marquardt, and his wife, Hannah, Hannah, we called her, I called her Tanta Hannah, which is aunt. So my Tanta Hannah and my uncle Fritz, they took in mom and dad, and they allowed them to live in their house, but the Marquardts also paid for my mom and dad's flight here. So they had to pay them back. So when mom and dad got here, they worked for my, for my great uncle, Uncle Fritz, in a machine shop that he had in downtown Los Angeles. So they had to work their time through, work on the punching press, punch press, and, and do all this stuff until they basically were able to pay off their debt to, to them. Um, but can you imagine coming to a different country with eight bucks, that's it, and not knowing the language, and you're just coming from a country that just finished a world war with these guys. So there was concern for them, you know, as to how they were gonna be accepted. But they were accepted fine. The United States is a wonderful, forgiving country. And I never experienced any kind of hostility as a young man growing up, as a baby, 
Never even saw it, never heard of it. It was great. Anyways, they learned to speak English. Not the normal way that you and I would. We didn't just go ahead and learn. They got to learn by, by watching American TV because at the Marco at home, they all spoke German. So the only English they were really getting exposed to was what they could see on TV. And mom and dad got really good at watching wrestling, <laughs> roller derby. So, I mean, that's, that was kind of their English teachers. Dick Lane, whoa, Nelly. Anyways. Um, oh, by the way, they got to know all those wrestlers pretty well. I mean, I remember them talking about Gorgeous George, Freddie Blassie, Bobo Brazil, the Destroyer. These were all wrestlers back in that day. Unless you're as old as I am, you won't remember them. But, but anyways. Um, Life was always interesting. Mom did have a green thumb. She could grow practically anything. And oftentimes we would, we would have the bounty of her, of her food that she would have grown. Sometimes we liked it. Sometimes we loved it. Sometimes we didn't. <laughs> Tommy and I had a special place for the part that was um, when we didn't. We would sneak out the back door and throw them in the bushes. <laughs> but fortunately, it wasn't that often, but it did happen. Um, Tommy and I were such angelic young men. Um, we never made life hard for my mom. <clears throat> I don't think it's, don't hit me. Uh, mom was also a speed shopper. Doug mentioned that she was frugal, OK? When their sales were on, mom would go to the store and they would sometimes drag both of us along or just me. I remember trying to keep up with my mom and crying because I couldn't keep up. Mom was just gonna make that sale and, and get there before anyone else does. Um, one, you know, on Saturdays was kind of her date of, of respite. In other words, she would kind of have a little bit of that day off because dad was home and could take care of the kids. So one day, mom goes to her beauty shop. She did every single Saturday, went to the beauty shop, got her hair done, got looking really nice and whatever. And Tommy and I were outside, we were playing. And I decided that we were gonna play a little bit of Indians and cowboys. And so, since I had the hatchet, Tommy was going to be a cowboy. And the truth is, is that I was going to go ahead and pretend to scalp him. He doesn't have much hair now. But as I, as I did that, you know, I took the ax and I started to come down with it, you know, and I just said, okay, I'll just stop right here. Well, it didn't quite stop. <laughs> And I hit him in the head. We put a little gash in his head. It wasn't very serious, but you know how head wounds are? They bleed like crazy. So my dad, he goes and he, after, after I ran to him and say, Dad, Dad, you know, I hit Tommy with the, over the head here and he's bleeding. And so he runs out and he checks and he goes, oh my God, my dad did not handle these emergencies very well. So he quickly, he, he was thinking, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? So he gets on the phone, and he calls my mom, who's at the beauty shop, and he says, Ozo, come home now. Frankie hit Tommy over the head with an ax, and there's blood everywhere. <laughs> and he hangs up. <laughs> That's true. My mom, my, my dad, my mom finally shows up when she shows up at the home. The bleeding had stopped. Tommy and I were ready to go out and play some more. And that was, that was the end. But that's a true story. <laughs> Your head still hurt? <laughs> um, anyways, that, that, was, that, that's, that did happen. Um, anyways, when I was nine years old, I started to play baseball. And I begged mom to let me join a team, and she did. 
And so I was on Fields Mobile. I, my friend Larry back here, he was also on that team. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I loved baseball. I loved it ever since, and it, we enjoyed it. My mom didn't understand the game at all. She didn't know it, but she came to every game. Very faithful and came with us and you know, she, she watched every game. She learned the game by watching us. My dad never did learn the game. Nah, nah. I remember striking out and dad would be going, yay, Frankie, yay. Fr <laughs> <clears throat> True story. Mom had, was very loyal to her friends and had good friends. And some of you are still here that have been around for a long time. Um, and I thank you all for coming, first of all. Uh, it, it was great. It's great to see you. But she loved reconnecting with her friends on the weekends. And I remember her for years, you know, her and her friends would get together and they'd either meet at a place called Brook Myers or they would go to Alpine Village or, and they'd have fun. And, and Oma could sit there and, and just have fun, drink a few glasses of wine and sit there and do the chicken dance all night long. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to make you do the chicken dance. Um, they loved vacations, especially Lake Tahoe, the cruises they were able to get. But like Doug said, that her favorite thing in the world was babies. Jeannie and I weren't married, but for a half a year, and we said, like, when are we going to have babies? When are we going to have babies? I'm sure Joyce, you heard the same thing, right? <laughs> um, but whenever there was a baby around, whether it be be our children, Doug's children, Stephen's children, any, any children that were around, mom had to have her hands on that baby, lift them up, and hold them and play with them. And that would give her the biggest smile that she could have. It made her very happy. Mom, we miss you. We're going to miss you more. Um, but we loved you. You loved us. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and uh, now her uh, second son, Tommy, and boy, this explains so much. <laughs> Tom Mueller. Thanks, Billy. Um, yeah, as uh, you heard, uh, Doug and Frank uh, said pretty much everything I was going to say. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh. That better? Okay. Um, Oma, Ursula, Mom, Ozil. Um, my mom had several names. Um, she lived a good long life. Uh, she, we had her cremated and her ashes are uh, right next to my dad in Rose Hills. Um, my dad always said if we ever cremated him, we're not allowed to put him in the ocean because he never learned how to swim. <laughs> True story. Um, go ahead, one more. Um, now this is a picture when um, Oma on her first day of school and in Germany, all the kids get this big cone and they fill it with candy. So it's kind of a fun day for the kids to go to school. You know, I, mean, I remember going to school the first day and I was kind of scared. They make it fun for the kids, so that was pretty neat. Now, um, Oma's father was a photographer and um, a painter. And he had um, several pictures that he took. And we're fortunate because we had um, quite a few pictures of Oma when she was younger. Um, and then, uh, my father was uh, drafted into the German army at the ripe age of 14, and um, he uh, served, and uh, he loved the Americans, but now he was looking to battle with the Americans, and him and his friend uh, right there, uh, they were in a um, uh, foxhole, and the sergeant told him, you know, we're going to shoot you if you surrender. So, okay, okay, okay. 
and uh, all of a sudden they see all these tanks and, and uh, a few hundred uh, uh, infantrymen coming, and they said, we'll, we'll take our chances with the Americans. And uh, they surrendered. He was in a prison camp in France where uh, uh, he was, uh, after the war, released. And then, as Frank mentioned, he, he worked uh, as an MP for the United States government where he went to Berlin and he met my mother on New Year's Eve at a party. And, um, and then they, they um, started courting each other. And you could see my mom and dad with my mom's parents there and the cute couple right there. My mom with her parents and her uh, younger sister, uh, Ingrid. And here's their wedding picture. Uh, as, as Frank mentioned, they did have to get married. Or they didn't have to get married, but they wanted to get married, so they come to the United States. Um, and, um, and there's yeah, another picture there. And then this is the actual plane they flew on to come to the United States. Um, it's a picture of Oma on the plane. And uh, Frank mentioned uh, uh, Tante Hannah and Uncle Fritz. And one more. Now there's a picture of uh, Uncle Fritz and Tanahana with my mom. Uh, they're the ones who sponsored them to come over. Um, that they had to, you know, live in a garage for two years with another family. Um, and they, they had to, of course, work off all you know, their wages. Now, uh, Tanta, oh, back one. Tantahana, sorry. Uh, Tantahana is, uh, means aunt in German. And Uncle Fritz, uncle means uncle in English, so. Can write that down then. Okay. Um, this is. Oh, sorry. That better, ma'am? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dee Dee. Um, so, this is the first time they're in the desert, and then the. Uh, Next, next time is the first time they ever saw Lake Tahoe, and Lake Tahoe would be a place where they'd see a lot more. Every summer, we'd grow up as kids, and we'd go to Lake Tahoe with them, and we'd spend anywhere from three to four weeks in Lake Tahoe. Um, then Frankie was born, um, and uh, they moved to a, a, an, an apartment in Alhambra and bought a property of land in Rosemead and had a house built there that we still home to this day. Um, and then uh, I came along, so you see the cute little kid on the right is me. Um, but as, as uh, Frankie mentioned, it's kind of tough raising boys, uh, especially when one's Frankie. Um, you know, because that story he told, I was an unsuspecting two-year-old, and he was a terrifying six-year-old. And, uh, and th this is the, the word my mom told me, was that uh, my dad heard me screaming. He was quote, watching us that day when my mom was at the hairstylist. And he ran out and saw me bleeding and panicked, as Frank said. And, and it, you know, in the 1950s, you don't have cell phones, right? So he had to use a phone, but they didn't have a phone. They couldn't afford that. So they went to the neighbors and called, their, you know, called my mom. And that's when he said, Frankie hit Tommy in the head with a hatchet. Tommy is bleeding. Come home now, click. Um, and they did get a phone after that. Um, and although some may disagree, I did not suffer any brain damage. <laughs> now, my mother would say, uh, a lot. In fact, our neighbors heard that phrase. And it's just a German phrase, like, oh, darn it. Um, having lived through World War II, she was a tough lady. And uh, we would often wake up in, in the night hearing my mom scream because she'd have nightmares of the bombing, the Allied bombings in Berlin. And this is a regular occurrence. Um, and then uh, to show you how tough she was, you know, one time at our house she stepped on a rake, but not a regular rake, but one of those ones with the spikes that come up. And her foot literally went through, the spikes went through her foot. Uh, get this, she didn't even cry. It, it just, it, she's a tough lady. Um, I used to brag about how strong she was because for 20 years she raised two dumbbells. Sorry, Frank. Um, in 1975, uh, Frank uh, married a beautiful young girl by the name of uh, Jeannie Johnson. Um, I don't know if you know that was her maiden name, Johnson. 
Okay, I guess no one did. Um, and then in 1987, her younger son married a beautiful young lady named Joyce Peterson. Uh, you may know her maiden name was Peterson. A few of you did, okay. Um, and then she went back to Germany. Oh, another picture of me and mom. And that's her sister Ingrid, Tanta Ingrid. And there's a picture of Oma uh, with the Rhine River, which she loved. Um, and Oma had five grandchildren, as Doug mentioned, that she absolutely loved. Um, first, Michael, and then Eric, Christy, Jeffrey, and Danny. Now, this is her holding Christy as a little baby, and she absolutely loved babies. Now, as was referenced by Doug already, uh, she was very disappointed when Frank was not Monica. Um, but she was also disappointed when I was not Monica. And so her hope was in the grandchildren. So when Frank and Jeannie had their boys, they had, you know, two children, but they were both boys. And then we finally had Chrissy, so she was elated. Even though she wasn't a Monica, you know, at least she got a girl. And then, of course, we had two more boys. And to make it extended even farther, Michael has two children two boys, and Christy has two children, both boys. So almost surrounded by all these boys everywhere. Um, we celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary with a surprise party at the Bavarian Inn in San Gabriel. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, one more. Yeah, nice picture. Oh, sorry about that, a little risque. And then this was their 50th wedding anniversary at uh, Biola University. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that, there's Pop and Mimi right there and some other people I don't recognize. Uh, just kidding, Bruce. She loved dancing. And here is uh, Francel and Ani. Francel is playing the accordion and Ani's to the right uh, doing you know, some singing and dancing. Um, and this was always a great time for them. Uh, my mom, in fact, would go to the Bavarian Inn every Saturday night and see Francel and Ani and their other friends. They'd sing and dance, just have a lot of fun. Uh, as Pharaoh was there uh, several times, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> and um, several years ago, Francel passed away, and then subsequently my father did too. Uh, but Ani and, and my mom uh, remained steadfast friends. And it was really neat because when my mom was in, moved into Sorrento Casa, she was, uh, she was 90 years old. Um, and Ani would uh, write her letters and then we'd FaceTime her. And it was really neat because in my mom's later years, she couldn't talk very well, you know, and it was hard for her to communicate. But Ani, she's really on top of it. She could, she could speak very well. Uh, she's only 93 though. And um, she would tell Oma about all these things that they used to do and reminisce and tell her she loved her and tell her she prays for her every day. It was just wonderful to have that conversation. Um, and then, of course, Ed Peterson, AKA Pop, um, moved into Sorrento Casa. And it was really neat because we could visit them and they could spend time together and sometimes have dinner together. And that was really special. Uh, the staff at Sorrento Casa was uh, extremely good for both Pop and Oma. Um, and, I, and I need to tell you a story that when Joyce and I saw Pop, he was okay, stabilized right before he died. We didn't know that. We went up to visit Christy and the boys, and um, um, we were told that when we got up there, we got a phone call and that Pop had passed away. And we were what? You know, we just saw him yesterday. And so um, after our visit, we came back home. We visited Sorrento Casa, you know, said hi to Oma. And the caregivers talked to us. And one in particular, Esperanza, she goes by Espy. And she told us that the night that Pop passed, they were with him. They knew it was close. So they had two ladies holding his hand, and, and Espy was there too. And they were being with him and, and comforting him. And so Espy told the other two, I'm going to go put Oma in bed. So I said, okay. So he puts Oma in bed. And, sorry, she looked around 
And Oman says, who's that man standing there? And SP looked around. There's no one here. And he goes, yeah, he's standing right next to you. And, and the SP re realized, oh, my gosh, she's talking about Pop. So she runs to the room, and they said Pop had just passed away, which is amazing. I don't know if that was Pop's angel or Pop himself, but it was just a neat thing for her to tell us that she's telling us she's crying. And it was wonderful because they cared so much. You know, they weren't just workers and don't get paid a lot of money, but they were really caring for Omen Open. I really appreciated that. Um, and then just finally one, one other brief story, and that's uh, about another worker there, uh, Josie. And she would lead Oma in these songs. It was cute. She'd be like a conductor and say, okay, let's sing these songs. And most of them were German songs that you couldn't understand. But um, usually the song was Amen. You know, the song goes, Amen, 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 from the lilies of the field. And it was cute because when she did that, people around her, even people who lived there, they'd sing with them. And it was, it was great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tommy. Joyce, you can do it. You can do it. Hi. I remember the first day I met Ursula, Oma. I loved hearing her strong German accent, and it made me so glad that I had taken German in college and had lived in Germany for one semester. I loved hearing about her life growing up in Germany and living through World War II. She told some of those stories over and over many times, but I'm so glad our kids got to hear about them too because they learned so much and appreciated what they had so much more. It always cracked me up when she would say how spoiled Tommy and Frank were growing up because I heard the stories from Tommy about how strict Oma was. But in her later years, the more rigid traditions melted and hugs and I love yous became more plentiful. And we realized that compared to what she went through, our lives in America are somewhat spoiled. You could never outdo Oma with a sob story. How could you outdo someone who had lived through a war <laughs> and starvation? If you shared a story of a difficult time or a situation, you'd get a comeback like, you think that's bad? I lived through a war. <laughs> Well, touche, you couldn't argue with that. And I'm sure anyone would have laughed the day Oma tried to teach me how to dig a garden. <laughs> she demonstrated with a spade shovel how to dig straight down into the grass, dig it up, move the grass off, turn the dirt over, move to the next spot, repeat row by row. I was eager and ready to try. I took the shovel and placed it next to where she left off and pushed and pushed, but nothing happened. <laughs> I tried again and again. The ground was too hard. Then I stood on the shovel and jumped up and down, and again, nothing happened. That day, I learned how weak I really was <laughs> and how incredibly strong Oma was. I was very impressed. I learned a lot about Oma during our parenting class, of all things. One chapter was on love languages. I realized her top two love languages were gift giving and acts of service. Those were my bottom two. <laughs> my top two love languages were quality time and words of encouragement. Guess what her bottom two were? <laughs> I came to see why we kept missing each other. When I learned about her love languages, I thought about all the gifts and home decor and things she bought and brought over all the time. And she would dig up bulbs and other plants at her house and bring them over to help start flowers and veggies. She loved bringing things over for the kids. She would take the time to print photographs and frame them creatively and give them to us. That's how she showed love. That made me love and appreciate her even more. These days we are learning a lot more about PTSD Looking back and hearing about some of Oma's anxiety and night terrors and getting easily startled, 
makes us think she might have had PTSD from all she witnessed and experienced during the war. I wish we could have realized that years earlier and helped her get complete healing from that. Still, she made the best of it and made a beautiful life in America with her family and church and wonderful friends. She was always so thankful to the Lord for her family and extended family and friends and always looked forward to getting together. Oma loved nature. She loved babies. She loved her friend Annie and getting together weekly in the summer at her house for swimming and lunch. She loved getting together on weekends, singing and dancing at the Bavarian Inn in Alpine Village. She loved gardening and making flower arrangements in vases and sharing them with others. She was generous. She loved projects and organizing. She loved the season of life where she invested in and created a beautiful dollhouse and her beautiful Christmas village. She had a gifted eye for lovely things and how to stage them for photographs. She loved us and we loved her and will miss her very much, but we're thankful we had her in our lives and are comforted that we will see her again. We love you, Oma. Thank you, Joyce. And now, uh, Jeannie Johnson. Is that correct? Mueller. Thank you all for, for coming today. It really means a lot. Oh, no, I'm going <clears> to. <throat> Anyways, we just love you all. And uh, Oma loved you all, too. And I'm going to sell the same things over again. So you're going to really know the story by the time we're done with this. But um, just thinking of Oma, just real quick before I read this little thing. Um, she just loved the kids so much. And uh, when we had our two boys, they were a handful, too. Mike and then... <laughs> and then our younger son, Eric, too. And one time we decided to go to Hawaii. And honestly, I don't remember their ages. Maybe they were six and eight or whatever they were. And um, so bless her heart, they were in school and they had daycare after school and that, but Oma was in charge of them. And so it was quite an adventure for her. And I remember um, when she came home, and I think we were gone like nine days, so it was quite a while, right, to leave them with two boys. But um, when she came home, bless her heart, or when we came home, as soon as we came up to the house and came in, she goes, I'm so glad you're back, and grabbed her purse. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, <laughs> No, I'm sorry, she did say a couple other things, and then she did that, you know, and that. But, uh, we, you know, that was a tough time, you know. But, and because our younger son, Eric, too, he had dumped over some syrup, and it was still kind of dripping a little, and, you know, <laughs> in the pantry. So she had an adventure going. But, uh, yeah, Oma just loved, loved people, and she loved planting and uh, gardening. She was very good at it, had a green thumb, and just um, loved giving gifts and stuff. And um, I'm just, she was awesome. I'm just going to go ahead and just read this little thing. I put a tribute to Ursula Mueller, a.k.a. Oma. She was a daughter, wife, mother, both grand and great. Also, she was an amazing woman. No one could think to debate. <clears throat> Willing to move away far, quite an adventure starting out. With Harry and eight dollars in their pockets, she deserves a great big shout. Leaving all her family behind, many memories both good and bad, the bombings in Berlin, her town, great danger, lives lost, it was very sad. Starting out fresh in America, living with relatives working hard each day, then building their own home in Rosemead, new life with God's provisions to stay bringing forth two wonderful sons, thinking she might have a girl. The name Monica never came about, and the boy's hair's too short to curl. <laughs> Frank and Tommy brought their own great adventures. She would go to all their sporting games, always cooking and working hard each day, excuse me, keeping everything smoothly going, a great feat to maintain. There were tenting 
or tent camping adventures, beautiful Lake Tahoe, sometimes wet with rain, floating sleeping bags on rafts in the tent, laundromat visits. She made it through and had some fun just the same. Always loyal to friends, loving parties and to celebrate, her times and memories at Alpine Village were always fun to make. I'm sorry, excuse me, I should have brought my Kleenex. Um, Generous with beautiful homegrown flowers, special desserts, German heritage, cooking to enjoy. Oh, thank you. Sorry. To enjoy. Special occasions together with uh, daughters in law and, of course, uh, her two wonderful boys. She loved being a grandma five times over, children to love and to show them special times each one having special memories in their hearts with those occasions, when those occasions still come to their minds. Oma loved entertaining and family gatherings, celebrations, and more. She was a thrifty shopper, a bargain hunter at every store. She made a good home for her family, faithful wife to Harry in younger and elder years, special care in their different difficult later stages, mixed with gladness and, of course, some tears. She has made an impact on all, on all our lives, whether family, friends, caregivers, or those just met. Now praising her Lord in heaven, smiling and singing with joy, she's not done yet. Thank you, Alma, for all you've taught us about life and family to love. You are now present forever with our Heavenly Father above. We love you, Oma, and look forward to being with you again. Together we will sing and dance to our Lord and endless eternity together. We're going to spend. <laughs> Thank you, Oma. I know that's a very challenging thing to share about your own family uh, in person. I have one more person uh, down to share, uh, Christy Mueller. No, I understand, You're right, yeah. Christy also loves babies. And as everybody has uh, their own special name in this family, Monica, backbreaker. Uh, this is Christy Girl. Oma was a very generous, thoughtful person. Um, those of you that knew her, that were blessed by her, if you could raise your hand if you were ever given flowers from her garden or fruit or veggies, could you just raise your hand if you're blessed by her gifts or something? Um, she, she loved people and loved to give. Um, she blessed us with lots of things growing up. As my mom said, she, um, it was like every time we saw her, she'd give us something. And um, so I had like the coolest Barbie collection. I think she was like making up for lost times because she didn't have much. Um, and like, I, I always joked because um, one time uh, when we moved to our new house, she gave me a, a purple hand towel and I'm like, I'm six. I'm in sixth grade. I got a hand towel. <laughs> like, it's such a funny present, but uh, it didn't. It was just like coming from her heart. She knew that we. It was something that we needed, and it went with my purple bathroom, and <laughs> it was really sweet. <laughs> um, I was fortunate to spend several weeks with her over the summer in college. Um, I worked out in Monterey Park, um, which was like maybe ten minutes from her house, and so I would. Um, and I only worked in the afternoons, and so I would get to um, have the mornings with her and then come back home um, to her house after and um, just get to um, 
get to know her better and hang out with her. Um, so she would wake me up really early, like 7 a.m. in the morning in the summertime, <laughs> which is ridiculous now. But in college, that is early. <laughs> She would cook for me. Um, sometimes she would take us out to fast food if she had like a coupon to Jack in the Box or something. We'd get the Western bacon cheeseburgers. And, uh, one time she made me a dish that looked a little different. I asked what it was and she didn't answer but she smiled and she was just like, try it. Uh, and I tasted it and was, I didn't want to be rude but she's like, you don't like it, do you? not really. <laughs> She's like, it's okay. I may do something else. And then she pulled out a whole nother meal in the fridge, but it was liver. She, <laughs> she was like, eh, just introduce it. Yes, the bushes. <laughs> uh, we would sometimes go shopping because she would, you know, we, ha we, we love our deals. Um, <laughs> Uh, every night after dinner, we would eat strawberries and play Remy Cube. Uh, I have such fond memories of my time with her, getting to know more about her, um, sometimes even getting to meet some of her church friends or German friends that would stop by. Um, I was recently reminded in college that I, I took a class that required us to make a meal with a relative that showed some of our culture. And um, my mom brought Oma over to us, and to, to the house, and we made Roladen together. Um, it was so special, and it was a lot of work. Um, I was really impressed that she would go through all that trouble um, to make it for us on special occasions. Uh, another funny memory I have of Oma was uh, she sent me a picture of herself in the outfit that she would wear to my wedding in case she didn't live to see it. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> she was a survivor. <laughs> um, Oma's face would light up when she would see me. And the last few years, it was when she saw my boys, which gave me a lot of joy to experience. She would always tell Mark to take care of my girl, and he does the best job of that. She was a special grandmother to me, and I loved her very much. Thank you. Christy, thank you for that correction. In your, in your uh, handout, can you cross off Mueller and write Christy Girl, Mueller, Morgan? <laughs> I do this a lot with my nieces and nephews. And now, uh, Daniel San, uh, the Japanese grandson, has uh, prepared for us uh, a video because a picture is worth a thousand words.
Thank you, uh, Danny. That was uh, that was uh, boy. That was just a lot of fun, which is what we'd expect from you. Beautifully done. And then, uh, yeah, and then we're reminded of uh, the fact that for for you guys in the last, you know, less than a year to lose Pop and to lose Oma. Life sometimes is hard. But there's a lot to remember and a lot to hold on to that's uh, very special. <clears throat> well, we have some food ahead. We've got a song or two left. So I'll be brief. Turn to your neighbor and say whatever you feel like saying. That's right, my Bible's under here. But I want to share one particular passage that's uh, uh, actually unusually fitting for Oma and her story that the Lord uh, reminded me of. But first I want to read the, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Oma could say, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, all of us can think in our lives of ways God has guided us. Few of us have needed God's guidance other than two young German uh, kids who lived through World War II. And the kids underpainted the t difficulty and the grief and the pain and the horror that they experienced. Oma could say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God invites us. We learn from this psalm. God invites us into relationship. Ursula Mueller Oma welcomed that relationship. And it changed her who she was as a person with all that she had gone through. Uh, you invite us into wholeness. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I didn't know, Tommy, your parents had been taking you guys as kids even to Lake Tahoe. As he's explained some other things also about uh, you uh, as well. But that the love of the green pastures and he leaves me beside quiet waters because he wants to restore my soul. And your mom and dad needed that just like every single one of us needs our souls restored for, because from time to time uh, when uh, the stress descends on us, the grief descends on us when our hearts are breaking, it's so wonderful to remember that God restores our souls. And he does that throughout the course of everyday life, but he has done that now completely for your mom and for your dad. And that's a beautiful thing. And then I love that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil. And every one of us walks through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, and we walk beside people who are going through the valley of the shadow of death. And so we're there right now as well. But we can remember the Lord is with us. That changes everything. It changes things for Frank and Tommy and Jeannie and Joyce and their kids and their kids today that you're here. It changes things. Does, does it take away uh, all the grief and pain? No. But it's different because they're not going through this alone. And that's what the Lord offers to every one of us, to walk with us through our griefs, our losses, and our pain. And it closes by saying, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And uh, it struck me watching the pictures sort of throughout her life, both, Tommy, the ones that you shared and the ones that Danny then added as well, <clears throat> that this was not the face of a haunted woman, despite whatever had gone on in her personal life and private. Uh, goodness and love followed her all the days of her life. And she now dwells in the house of the Lord forever. And she would want you to encounter her again at the reunion. I want to read one other passage of scripture, and then we'll sing a song. <clears> that just reminded me, kind of in the middle of the night, a, a verse came to me. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, by an act of faith, Abraham, we're going way, way back in time, at least 4,000 years in kind of human history. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going, nor the temperature in the Middle East there. But by an act of faith, he says the second time, by an act of faith, he lived in the country promised him. He lived as a stranger camping in tents, or in Ursula and Harry's case, in garage. Isaac and Jacob did the same, the kids of Abraham living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. 
Now, each one of these people of faith died without yet having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? Well, they saw it way off in the distance. They waved their greeting and accepted the fact that they were transients in this world. This world was not our home. Sometimes we would sing in days gone by. And Harry and Ursula knew this more than most of us because of that reality. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. If they were homesick for the old country, they would have gone back any time. They could have gone back any time they wanted. But they were after a far better country than that. Heaven country. And you can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. So we grieve, but we do not grieve as the pagans because we know where Ursula is and we know that she is now uh, alive forevermore, more alive than she's ever been. And she's whole. She's in a place where all the things that uh, have wounded us, uh, everything has changed. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Harry and Ursula understand that probably better than any of us do at this particular moment. But it's ours to hang on to because we're invited to make the living God also our refuge and that he has prepared for us a home, a new city to welcome us into and my goodness, the people we're going to greet there. It's going to be transforming. We want to sing a closing song and then one last bonus song at the end. So Kiefer, would you lead us? And would you stand as we worship the living God and thank him for his goodness and his grace.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who calls me here below will be And all God's people said. One final song, as I mentioned, from a group that's traveled all the way, really originally from Germany, then Rosemead, now Whittier, La Habra, West Covina. Give a warm Bethany welcome to Monica and Jeannie, backbreaking Tommy and Joyce. We're going to lead us in a song, and you're going to help us, all of you here. And I didn't put the words, Sherry said, why didn't you put the words in here? But it's because they're going to sing the verse and you're going to sing the chorus. And I think once you hear it, I think you'll be able to handle the chorus. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Either these two or both of them. Maybe each couple could use a mic. The chorus on this is truly easy. One word. Amen, you got it. And this, we'll be wrapping it up. Um, we're going to sing it and get you guys going with it. I don't want you clapping until Christ has risen. Okay? So you can clap along with the song as you want. Okay, are we ready? Yeah, Keeper will help with the refrain. Keep, Keeper will go with it too. Okay, go ahead, Keeper. It goes just like this. Amen. 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 Sing it over. Amen. 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 On Christmas morning. Amen. 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 Sing him at the temple. Amen. Talking with the elders. Amen. Marvel that is wisdom. Amen. Amen. Down at the Jordan. Amen. Amen. See him at the seaside, talking with the fishermen, and making them disciples. Marching to Jerusalem, over palm branches, in pomp and splendor. Thank you guys so much. Joyce, it's been a long time since we've heard you singing here at Bethany. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for joining in. Now, to honor Ursula, Oma, uh, we're going to enjoy, boy, a reception uh, out through these doors. If you join us, I'm going to let the family go ahead and go first. But we're going to have liverwurst. We're going to have bratwurst. We're going to have every kind of worst that we've ever had. 
we're going to have some liver, absolutely, to honor the, the family as well, and Christy Girl. And, of course, sauerkraut, which is, if you don't know it, it's Frank's absolute favorite. <laughs> or possibly not. Your, yours as well? Yes, both boys do not. Anyway, let me close this in prayer. Now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace by the power of the Holy Spirit as we trust in him so that we will overflow with hope. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. And amen. Family Feud, uh, lead us over and we'll join over in Anderson Hall for a reception. God bless you. Thank you for coming.